So uh, now a, a new introduction. I've already introduced Mike and now the people who are watching online. Uh, we have a special tonight. Mike Cooper from New Zealand will be sharing with us. And instead of giving you a long introduction about everything that I know about Mike, why don't we just let Mike come up and share with us what God is doing in New Zealand. So Mike, would you come up here? And would you give him a warm welcome? All right. I am really handsome, aren't I? <laughs> well, it's really good to be here. I see some familiar faces and it, the last time we were here was 2016. So uh, because of Brenda's health, we haven't been able to come back to the States and we're so thankful that you continue to support us, even though we've not been, been able to be back in to see you. And so since it's been a while, I will share a little bit more about New Zealand. Some of it may be redundant, but uh, New Zealand is an island country. We have two main islands, the South Island, North Island. Uh, we live on the North Island. Uh, New Zealand has about 5 million people. Uh, it has 10 sheep per person. That's more sheep per capita than anywhere else in the world. Um, and so if you buy sheep there, it's very expensive. So we don't eat sheep. Uh, they export most of it. They're the largest exporter of dairy in the world. They're the largest exporter of honey in the world. Um, the growing season in New Zealand is quite unique. Uh, our summers don't get real hot. The summers, um, generally, if it gets real hot, it gets up maybe 81, 82 degrees. Uh, typically at night, it will still get down into the at least the 60s. And um, Auckland is the humid area, so uh, sometimes we can get up to 40 or 50 percent humidity. And um, like all good Kiwis, we complain about that now, too. <laughs> Every once in a while, you know, I would tell Brenda, you know, it's a matter of perspective, isn't it? But um, we like it there uh, very much as our home. Uh, something I, I thought the youth might like this, but um, my wife and I and our daughter have dual citizenship. So we tra I travel with two passports. I've got a New Zealand passport, and I'll just pass that out for the youth or anybody that wants to see it. Um, and uh, it makes it easier for us to travel. We're a Commonwealth country, which means we're part of the British Commonwealth. So when Brenda and Meryl and I became citizens, we had to pledge loyalty to the Queen of England, and she is our queen. So um, that's part of living in the Commonwealth countries. We are an independent country, though. Uh, there are certain things that can be uh, pled to the High Court in England, but for all intent purposes, um, we don't really care about that anymore. So <laughs> the High Court made a ruling about eight or ten years ago, and the government said, thanks for your opinion, but we're going to keep doing what we're doing. So uh, we truly are independent. But um, because we're a Commonwealth country, we have much in common with the other countries like Australia. And so Australia is our uh, stepsister and uh, redheaded stepsister. So, but uh, anyway, uh, that, that's, that's, what, that's who we are. Uh, the native people are called Maoris, or if, you're, uh, from a, if you are a Maori, they're Moris. Uh, their R's are a bit different there, but most of the Pakihas, white people are Pakihas. And we just say Maori. Uh, some people call them Marys. Uh, they are Pacific Islanders, and uh, so that means they're Polynesian. And uh, what I found that I live there now, all Polynesian people look different. Samoans look different than Tongans, Tongans look different than Maoris, and so forth. And so if you saw them, they would probably all look the same to you. But now that I've lived there, you can tell the different facial feature features and things. Mm -hmm. So there's a very strong Polynesian influence upon New Zealand. And uh, so it's a very laid back culture that we live in. Uh, sometimes it's too laid back. Uh, when you want to get something done, people want to take a holiday. So uh, <laughs> that's kind of the culture that we live in. Uh, you see, like in Hawaii and other countries like that, the ukulele. Ukulele is very big in Polynesia. So we have people that do special music and they play the ukulele when they have their special music. That's a very popular instrument that they use. The population of Auckland, where we're at, we're in, in, a, in an area called Waitakere City. It's West Auckland. And uh, our population there is predominantly Pakeha and Asian. Uh, Auckland now is over 25% Asian. Asian is still the fastest growing people group. And when we go to a market in a vegetable market or an open market in West Auckland or anywhere in Auckland, it's not uncommon to hear five or six languages spoken. 
Um, that's something that Brenda and I have always enjoyed is hearing the different languages. And uh, as you see, the Polynesians go to church. Um, New Zealand is probably 2%, maybe 3% uh, true believing Christian. Uh, probably about 50% of New, Zealand, New Zealanders now today would claim Christianity as their religion, though they're not practicing Christians. Uh, there's not a lot of Catholics there, but we do find a lot of Anglicans because of the British influence. And some of the Anglican churches are actually quite good churches. Um, we don't agree with them on everything that they believe, but uh, they're actually very evangelistic and very solid in a lot of their doctrine. And then some of the uh, Anglicans are Episcopalians here. Uh, the rest of the world, they call themselves Anglicans. And so uh, because it's such a, a, a low percentage of Christians, we have a great outreach there. And so most of the people that we reach out to um, are our church is predominantly Filipino, but we reach out to Maoris, we reach out to Asians, uh, people from China, Singapore, Philippines, um, you can name just about any, any country, Sri Lanka, we've had Sri Lankans in our, uh, in our uh, church, so it's truly a multicultural uh, church that we minister in, and so we, we actually love that aspect very much. The, the, the Polynesians, when they go to church, um, oftentimes the Samoans, there will be Samoan churches, and you'll see the men, they dress up and they wear a tie and they have the black lava lava. Um, it, it's funny, that's the, that's the, does everybody know what a lava lava is? So that's, the, that's like the skirt that the men wear, kind of like a kilt in Scotland. Uh, the generic name that, that the Europeans have named it is lava lava, that's a Fijian word. But every culture has their different name for it, and I couldn't tell you what it is in Samoa, but it just gets dubbed the Lava Lavas. And so they'll have this, uh, they're, they're, they come down about midway on the shins. They're black, and that's their dress, Lava Lava. And so the men will wear those to church. Uh, when we go to men's retreats, oftentimes at night, um, the, the Polynesians, when they get ready for bed, they have a flowered one, and they wear a Lava Lava to bed instead of, uh, instead of pajamas. And so that's what they wear. Um, I would tease them about wearing a skirt, but most of the Polynesians are pretty big guys. So I don't really <laughs> say anything to them about it. So, But uh, yeah, so it's, it's, it's very interesting. We love the culture there. And the church where we minister at is Waitakere Bible Church. It was Waitakere City Bible Church. Auckland became a super city shortly after we moved there. It used to be four cities. Waitakere City was one of them. And now it's just... Auckland City, so they encompass them all. And like any government, uh, they they um, condensed everything into one city, so that way our, our taxes go up and fuel goes up and everything else goes up with it. So it's it's very efficient that way. Um, at Waitakere City, as I mentioned, we're predominantly Filipino. Uh, Brenda and I have been there for about 12 and a half years now. Uh, we have a young man, a Kiwi man that I've that we brought on board about almost two years ago now and I'm developing him to be pastor and replace me and so my goal uh, this year is to Lord willing finish Philip up and and everything works out um, I'm going to start transitioning to another work so I've got two things I'm looking at now I shared with Pastor Trey earlier um, there is a church very close to us that has no pastor and they've asked if I would come and help them so I may go and help them and do what we would consider church rescue it's a church that's mainly older people that it's it's dying and they they don't have a pastor and so uh, i know that a couple of leaders but one of them is a very good friend of mine and we uh, were prayer partners and so that's one thing i would ask you to pray for and that's new Lynn bible chapel that would be a possible work and so i will be doing some work with them this year i'm going to be preaching there two sundays in may um the other that I would like to do is plant another church in an area called Hobsonville or Albany. Uh, Hobsonville is still in West Auckland. It's about 10, 15 minute drive from where our church is now. So it's still within our area. And there's a great need. There's no churches really in the Hobsonville area. And it's a very much a growing area. And so we, we've targeted that as a church, as a possible church plant area. So that would be the other thing that I would ask you to pray about. Um, now, if, if I would do a church plant in Hobsonville, I would I really want to find a family that would be willing to come to New Zealand and assist me, a younger family. Um, 
I just, uh, I know I look 30 to you, but I'm really 62. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I'm, I'm realistic. Uh, I've, got a, I've got a limited time in ministry now, especially effective ministry. And what I would like to do is just pour into a young uh, family uh, what little knowledge that I have and, and, and work together with somebody so that we have a pastor that can come up there and then I can just be a support to them. And I really uh, want to pray fervently for that because that's what I would like to do. But I'm realistic that um, it would be very difficult for me to do by myself. So um, that's one of the things I would really, really love to do. And um, so that's us in New Zealand. Uh, New Zealand, the, the, the culture is quite different, but the landscape is too. Um, New Zealand, the thing I love about New Zealand is everywhere you go, it looks different. Um, you can go out the, in Auckland, we have 48 volcanoes spread amongst our city and they're all small volcanoes. And if you just go south of us and you get down to Matamata, about two hours away, that's where they filmed the Hobbit. That's where they have, or part of the Hobbit. That's where they have Hobbits in it. And you can go visit the Hobbit in the village. And when you're up high and you look down over the hills in Matamata, it's like green carpet. And the, my first thought when I, when I went to Matamata and looked down over those hills was, I know why Peter Jackson picked this place. But, you know, you go about another 10 to 12 miles uh, to the south and you start going to Rotorua. And Rotorua is, was uh, actually developed by a super volcano. A super volcano is a huge volcano. And so you start going up and, and immediately the topography begins to change. And as you, you go up, you, you eventually start going down and you're going down into the crater of the volcano. And there's a huge lake and that's where the mouth of the volcano was. Still a lot of seismic activity. Um, a lot of areas smell like rotten eggs from the steam coming up out of the ground. And uh, they, a lot to see there. As you go a little bit farther south, and it begins to change again. And you're going towards Lake Taupo. And in the middle of, if you ever look on a map and see the North Island of New Zealand, in the middle of the North Island, there's a huge lake, and that's Lake Taupo. And that's a really big super volcano. That volcano is so big that the edge of the lake is 100 miles around. Can you imagine a volcano? They have rocks that literally blew miles away when, it, when it, that volcano blew. It's just hard to imagine. All the topography and everything around there was developed by or, or was made by that volcano when it erupted millions of years ago, they say. But uh, So uh, you go a little bit farther south and, and you get to Wellington and it's completely different. Looks like a different area. We've been far up north and it looks um, completely different in Northland, the landscape, everything. So everywhere you go in New Zealand, it looks different and it's beautiful. It's very beautiful. The skies are extremely blue because we have a very thin ozone layer. And because of that thin ozone layer, it gives us a beautiful sky and also gives us skin cancer. We have the highest incidence of skin cancer in the world. Uh, they ingrain into our children at a very young age, that they always wear a hat, that they always put sunscreen on. You probably never notice it, but when you look at the weather, there'll be a little thing with color on there. It's called a UV rating. It really doesn't mean anything to you. It's very important to us because if the UV rating is high and it's a, and it's a rating of 10, it means if you're out in the sun unprotected, in 10 minutes, you're going to start burning. That's how bad our sun is. So it's, it's, it's a different way of living. You have to be cautious sometimes when you go outside. In the wintertime, when it's cold, you can be in a jacket. And if it's a sunny day, you'll get extremely hot because that will start burning through your jacket if the sun is so hot. And it's, it's something that you just have to experience to know what I'm talking about. Uh, on a day when it's 65 degrees, if it's clear out, it feels like it's 85 or 90 sometimes. If you step in the shade, you, you might need to put a jacket on. It's that much different. The sun is so intense. Well, uh, if we come back to Auckland now, um, Auckland has islands dotted around it as well that you can go and, and visit. And, it's, and they've got wineries and things like that. But we're on an isthmus. And so we have the Tasman is to the west and the Pacific is to the east. And... The, the oceans come very close together. In fact, if you get up on some high points, you'll see that the oceans probably come within 
maybe five or 600 yards of each other. That's how close they, they come to meeting. And um, on the west coast is the Tasman and it's predominantly volcanic sand. So it's black sand. And it's actually magnetic. You can put a magnet in and it'll just fill up with the sand. Uh, on the other coast it's lighter sand. On the west coast, the black sand coast is very dangerous. We get a lot of rip currents on the west side. You go on the east side, it's very calm and it's very safe to, to swim on the east side. The oceans tend to be much colder because of the Arctic currents. So we just, my daughter just uh, messaged me. I had my tomato plants out and she said, she sent me a picture and said the cyclone came through and it's killed almost all your, all your tomatoes. And so she said she picked a few off of it. But we get the, it, when we get cyclones, this is the brunt of the cyclone. Our oceans are so cold that when the cyclones get close to New Zealand, they lose their strength. So we never get a cyclone force or hurricane force wind, but we do get a lot of rain and wind when they come in. We get a lot of land slips and things like that. And so we're pretty safe from the cyclones other than we just get all the stuff we don't want. Now on, on a note on winter, as I came here, uh, as you can see my picture, that was taken on January 30th at our family camp. <laughs> and I decided that I come here and, and suffer for Jesus with you guys in this weather that you guys have here. <laughs> And I don't see that white stuff at home anymore. And I'm thankful for that, especially now. I, I've, I've sworn for the second time now I'll never come back again on winter, but uh, we'll see. Our winters in Auckland uh, get cold, and it's the rainy season, so we get cold rains. Um, sometimes it can get down to freezing, and we might get hard frost. And we get really tired of the cold, wet winters, but I never, ever have had to shovel rain. So, <laughs> so I'm thankful for that. Um, so it is a beautiful city. We love living in Auckland. My, my wife and I are both country folk. We were raised in the country. We had a small farm in the country before we moved there. We weren't sure how we would do in a big city, but we love living in Auckland and it's our hometown. Does anybody have any questions? Well, it's really a long story. So you said I had till nine o'clock, right? Sure. Um, uh, years ago, uh, I got involved with our missions board at the church that I was at. And Brent and I just always had a passion for missions and we supported missionaries and, and, and love missions. And um, I, I was very much evangelistic when I worked in a secular job. And so uh, I worked for the, uh, I worked for Isuzu Motors, the manufacturing plant, the Subaru in, in Lafayette. And they sent me to Japan. And so I would go to Japan to do um, uh, prototype builds. And when I would go, I, I made connection with some missionaries there. And I did some stuff with the missionaries. And I just got a greater passion and love for, for missions, and especially for Asian people, because I worked with Japanese all the time. And so my wife and I thought, um, after I'd had some training and we had done some lay ministry work, uh, we thought that we would go to Japan. That's what we thought the Lord had in, in store for us. And so uh, we went to a different mission board and they have these, I call them uh, language adaptability tests. They test your propensity to learn a, a foreign language. And of course, by then I was mid forties. And uh, my joke is they said, uh, I set the record for the absolute lowest score for language <laughs> adaptability. And they highly recommended that I didn't try to learn another language. They said we wouldn't prevent you from going if that's what you thought God wanted. And I thought there was some wisdom to it. I, I did speak a little bit of Japanese, um, about enough to get in trouble while I was there. But um, but I, I could see that it would have been difficult for me to, to pick up a foreign language. So we went to our mission board and we applied and we talked with them. And uh, Paul Sager, the, the uh, director at the time, he said, have you thought of going to an English speaking country? And I said, I never really thought of that. And he said, well, you know, we've got Scotland and Ireland and England. And I was like, I don't want to go to Europe. And I, I really thought at that moment, I thought, I'm not going to go to missions. And he said, well, you know what? We do have a couple countries down uh, in the Southern Hemisphere. We've got Australia and New Zealand. And I didn't know much about New Zealand, but I knew about Australia. And I knew Cro Crocodile Dundee came from there, so it must be something, right? <laughs> uh, the Crocodile Hunter and all those other guys. And 
So I said, ah, we consider that. So um, we did some research and decided that we would take a survey trip and check both countries. So we went to New Zealand first, and we went to Australia second. I'm so glad we went to New Zealand first. We were in New Zealand uh, three days, and Brenda and I had some time alone, and I said, do we need to go to Australia? And she said, no. And so we just felt God called us to New Zealand. And so uh, uh, one of the things that we thought is we originally wanted to reach out to the Japanese, and Auckland was 25, at that time was 25% Asian, and it was the fastest growing people group. So we said that blends in with the ministry that we were thinking of. So um, as it turns out, our ministry again is predominantly to Filipinos uh, and they used to be Asians, but now, I don't know if you're aware of this, but I think it was last year, the U.S. re-categorized them as Pacific Islanders, so they're not Asian anymore. Uh, but, yeah, so that's, that's I guess, this, the story of how, how we got there, and that's how we got into missions, and that's how we got to New Zealand, and uh, thankful ever since that, that we've gone there. Yeah. You said there's some Chinese there? Yeah. Yeah, um, well, it's, it's just Asian in general, but the, the Asians are predominantly Chinese. Yeah. Mm. But but they're from everywhere in Asia. I mean, I know people from Vietnam. In fact, I know, I know a Vietnamese pastor that pastors a Vietnamese church. There's Koreans, there's Chinese, there's Singaporeans, um, there's Koreans uh, not very far from us. They have a very large Korean church. Um, just over on the North Shore, they have another very large Korean church. Um, so it's just all Asian pe people groups in general have, have uh, immigrated to Auckland, or New Zealand, but mainly Auckland, yeah. If you go to other cities outside of Auckland, except for Wellington, which is the capital, um, they can be pretty plain. It can be just Pacific Islanders and Caucasian people, and you don't find as many Indians and Asians as you do in Auckland, but... A nice thing about Auckland, New Zealand in general, but especially Auckland, is they have a very diverse ethnic food. I mean, there's, and it's very original food too. Like Chinese food in Auckland isn't the same as Chinese food downtown here. It's very authentic. Yeah. So, um, and I found that almost all Asian food is about the same to me. <laughs> they all taste pretty similar, except for a couple of different ones. Japanese is very much different. And, and I cook some Japanese dishes, but. Yeah, and the, you see the, the British influence, you have fish and chips, you have the meat pies, and no, they're not banquet pot pies. <laughs> it's not the same. Uh, they're, they're quite good. They have Turkish food, they have Turkish kebabs, which are, are a type of pita wrap. They're really, really good. Um, Indian, they have butter chicken, which is really difficult to find here. It's a curry, that, but it doesn't have a strong curry taste, and that's quite popular. Um, one thing I learned, I love spicy food, and I made the mistake one time of ordering butter chicken in an Indian restaurant. I said, could I have that spicy, please? And so I threw half of it away, and I drank about three gallons of water after that, and it didn't help, but anyway, yeah. yeah. yeah Indians are very spicy. Mario had a, a, an Indian, a, a little girl, she was Indian, a friend from across the street when we first moved there. So we would invite her for dinner sometimes. So I put cane pepper on my stuff. We had spaghetti. And I said, uh, Amisha, would you like some cane pepper? And she said, yes, please. And she takes on her spaghetti and just. <laughs> and so she's eating. And I said, do, do you need more cane pepper, Amisha? She said, yes, please. And by the time she was done, I was sweating just watching her eat. <laughs> they, they love it spicy. I, 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 I really, I'm a wimp when it comes to Indian food, truly. Um, but yeah, it's very diverse, all kinds of Asian people, Sri Lankans, Indians. Uh, in New Zealand, they have uh, Indians that are from India, and then they have Indians that had moved to Fiji about three generations ago, and they kept their language and culture. They still speak Hindi. They still make Indian food. I'm sure it's, it's changed over time a, a bit. Um, but they've immigrated there too. And I don't know if you know much about India, but they're very much a caste culture. They're, they're probably the worst in the world. And so higher caste people don't associate with lower caste people. And I found, found out really early, we rented off a, an Indian from India. 
And I mentioned something about some Indians along the road. And he said, oh, no, that's Fijian Indians. Real Indians wouldn't do that. And uh, there's, a, there's a huge prejudice. And I mentioned something to Liana before she moved back to the States about that because she had some Indian friends. And she said, uh, she, she, she had not known that. I, I just said something about the prejudice that was there. And she said, that must be why Manasseh won't speak to John B. <laughs> because Manasseh was from India and John B. was from P PG. And so it's very much, uh, the Indians are very much like that. They're quite different in the culture. One of the things that we really like about New Zealand is a very non-racist country. I mean, you know, it, it doesn't matter. You can be Pacific Islander, you can be African, you can be American, you know, you can be any Asian and you, you get pretty much treated the same by everybody. There's just very little prejudice there. Uh, one of the things I asked Liana after she moved back here, what she missed about New Zealand, and one time she said, the lack of racism. Uh, my daughters truly grew up not understanding what we've seen in, in our country here in the last couple of years. It's just completely different, you know. And, and you know, you can make Samoan jokes and everybody laughs and nobody's offended. <laughs> and Samoans are very funny people. They, they, have, they have a funny sense of humor and they like it if you make fun of them and they make fun of themselves and they're just lovely people. I have, I have Samoan friends. I just love them to death. Yeah, they're, they're so much fun though. They're just hilarious. Anyone else? What's the national sport? Oh, rugby. Yeah. Anything else? Uh, yeah, the, it's, it'd be rugby, then rugby, then rugby. <laughs> and then we have a few sissies that play soccer then, then rugby <laughs> uh, New Zealand has won the World Cup they play the World Cup every four years they won it two times in a row no country has ever done that they won the most World Cups, Cups of any other country and we're a country of only 5 million people that's really small and it, it really says a lot for um, New Zealand. The first World Cup I actually got to watch at a camp, at a youth camp, and they had it on the big screen, and I had a friend explain it to me, and I was so overjoyed as American because, A, I was a Kiwi now, too, and Kiwis won, and B, they were playing France, and they beat France, and I'm an American. I didn't want France. <laughs> so it was like a double, double joy for me, but it's pretty much, it's pretty much rugby. Uh, for the girls, they have a, a sport called netball. Meryl is very good at netball. She loved playing. I really enjoy watching netball. And you just have to see it to understand it. But only girls play it. And you play on a court like a basketball court. It's got a smaller ball and a smaller rim, no backboard. And, and you have seven on each team. And they have offensive and defensive players. And they have certain zones that they can play in. If they cross the line, they get penalized and so forth. Um, and it's a passing game. You can't dribble the ball and you can't run with it. So it's a, it takes a lot of talent. Um, but that's really popular. We have a professional netball team. It's mainly a common sport. And so you find the Commonwealth countries play. And they have a semi-pro team that, that we can see in our area that they play in the season as well. But rugby's came. All the kids grew up playing rugby. I still don't understand it. <laughs> yeah. I was hoping that you could explain why they push the ball out of the back of the, you know, of the scrum. Yes. I mean, they always the so when they have a scrum, they get together, they get together and, and they put the ball in and then they have to push as hard as they can, but they have to push it back and somebody in the back gets the ball and then they start running the scrum breaks up and then they try to, they try to get him. And um, so in rugby, um, rugby, they don't have pads or anything. So, Rugby is like a, a men's sport. It's not like football. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, real men play rugby. <laughs> uh, I haven't played it. Sometimes they play touch rugby, but I haven't. Yes? There's too many sissies here that I can't think of right now. <laughs> <laughs> So you said in your secular job, you're very evangelistic. Did you notice moving to a different culture? Did you have to change the way you were evangelistic? Did things translate well? Is there different ways? How are people most receptive to the gospel? 
You know, it's probably not that different. You have to you have to build relationships. The problem in New Zealanders are so secular. Um, what you find is the Asians and Pacific Islanders are open to the gospel um, <clears throat> because they have a, a generally they have a, a background. Or the Asians are thinkers. So, like um, I, I know some some Chinese that that were reached in New Zealand and now they're going back to China as missionaries, and our, our church is supporting them. And, um, you know, he, they're, they're open to new ideas like Chinese and many Asians. Some Asian countries are very Christianized. Uh, but the Pakihas, the, the white European Kiwis, they have no interest in religion at all. And the sad thing is, is when the Europeans came, the Anglicans were very faithful um, Christians back in that time in the 1800s. And they helped they helped forge a treaty between the Europeans and the Maoris, and they were held in very high esteem. And there were a lot of uh, chieftains and, and things that were converted back in you know the early 1800s. And so Christianity had a great foothold, but they became very secular um, years later. And so now the white Europeans <clears throat> are just very secular and they're very polite but they're really not interested in religion. They're very difficult to reach. Hmm. We have a, a man in our church, one of my best friends, Graham, and uh, his parents um, are typical hockey house. They, you know, Graham's witness to them. We've all tried to share with them and they have no interest. They're polite, but they really don't want to talk about the Lord. They don't want to talk about religion at all. Very difficult to reach them. Uh, the difficulty I find in the U.S., is when I witness here is everybody had the right answer. Mm. You know, you could talk about it and, and everybody, oh yeah, I, I was saved when I was five or, you know, I, I just constantly dealt with that. And it, and it was a process here of explaining to them what sin was and why they needed a redeemer um, it, when they thought that they were okay. Mm -hmm. and so it's a little bit different in that aspect, but um in other ways, it's, it's pretty much the same. You just have to build relationships. You build the trust, and then people, you know, listen to what you say. So it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a long process. The average church in New Zealand is probably less than 30. The churches are very small. Uh, we have bigger churches, but not very many. Our church, our church, we can run mid-30s to sometimes mid-40s if we, if we get real high numbers. But most of our, that, that's if we have people that, that just... Um, visit but our, our people are very faithful so they're almost always all there yeah so a non-religious question then talk about your rivalry rivalry with australia that red-headed step sibling uh, i just I, I don't know what to say uh, <laughs> is, yeah, there, is know, there animosity not yeah. but friendly animosity between yeah the two? so there's a there's um, a very good relationship between um new zealand and australian if if you want to really get um, on the bad side of a Kiwi, just ask them if it's an Australian accent. Yeah. And to you, their accent will sound Australian. So you would assume they're Australian. It's very offensive to them. <laughs> they, don't, they don't like to be called Aussies. Right. Um, you know, Aus Aust it, with New Zealand, not like uh, I have the passport. I can't. I, I need that back, by the way. <laughs> good, good job. <laughs> I need that to go home. <laughs> um, so I can move, if I want to, I can just buy a ticket and move to Australia. I don't have to have a visa. I can get a job there. Um, an Australian can move to New Zealand as long as they have an Australian passport. They can get a job. They can live there as long as they want. They can retire in New Zealand. No, no visa or anything. So they have a special bond, a special relationship. But there's definitely, because of that, there's a rivalry. So here we refer to uh, England as across the pond. Mm -hmm. You've heard that. Um, Australia is across the ditch. Okay. It's, our it's our cousins across the ditch, gotcha. and they say the same thing. He was their cousins across the ditch, about twelve hundred miles, I think, something like that away. Yeah. But it's it's a fun rivalry. But Australia is a very inhospitable country. I mean, it's brutal. The whole interior is desert, and a lot of Kiwis move there because there's more money. But it's just a brutal place to live. I mean, the most dangerous animals are there. Um, you know, it's uh, Sydney. Sydney can reach get temperatures well over 110 degrees in the summertime. Uh, they do a lot of their work early morning, like they outside work. Sometimes they'll start at like two o'clock in the morning, and they'll finish like nine o'clock because it gets too hot. 
Um, I've talked to Kiwis that were there and they said that sometimes the air con doesn't keep up to cool in the summertime. And uh, we, we flew in one summer and we flew into Sydney and we had a layover and it was one of those years they were in a heat wave. And I remember in the airport, as soon as we got off the plane, we started sweating. It was so hot in there and they had the air conditioning on. I couldn't live there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I don't know why anybody would want to live there. <laughs> if you get a little farther south, Melbourne and stuff, then it becomes more moderate. It's not so bad. Uh, Sydney, very hot. You get up towards um, Cairns and it becomes more tropical. They grow a lot of bananas and stuff in Australia. Mm -hmm. The whole interior is just desert. Nobody yeah. lives there. Yeah. Is this your church family? Yeah, so this is our church. This was our camp. Um, that's uh, out on the ocean there where we're at. Uh, we, we always we always have a beach where we have our camp. We have it every, it's always the last weekend in January. That's the anniversary weekend for Auckland. So it's holiday weekend. So we always do it then. And this is a new camp and we quite liked it. So we think we're going to go there for a while. It's about a two and a half hour drive from us. The uh, original camp we went to was definitely the best beach in the world. It's called Cooper's Beach, so that you can't beat that, <laughs> you know. And um, but it was about four hours north, and we loved it. We went there for ten years, but people were saying that's a long way to go for three days. So we we looked for some place close. We went some place else last year, about the same distance, but it was the other direction, and it didn't work out so well. But this one fits us perfectly. The the rooms they have, the kitchen's the right size. Close to the ocean, everything's just right. So, well, I think we're going to go there for the next several years, probably. Um, yeah. So, as you can see, there's a lot of brown people in there, and those are, in fact, uh, they always refer to the Filipinos in our church as the brown kiwis, brown kiwis and white kiwis. We we'll always need more white kiwis. So, again, nobody's offended by remarks like that in New Zealand. How do you perform wedding services? Um, I have not performed any, um, however, we've had some in our church, and there's a lot of reasons I can get into with you later about the wedding, but uh, the one thing is, it's, it's very much Western, but they have a, a, a special ceremony, it's a signing ceremony, and so after the wedding, part of it is, they have a table set aside, and they have the marriage license there, and the, um, I don't know. I'm trying to think what they call it. it's a it's like the pastor but um, they call it the celebrant you have to have a license to be a celebrant the celebrant has to sign it and then the bride and groom sign it and then the witnesses sign it and that's part of the tradition is it's they get a lot of pictures of signing the, the license and that's very much a big part of it at when, the, when the vows are done is taking those pictures but other than that it's very similar to our wedding How many what? How many children do you have? Too many. You want some? <laughs> <laughs> I have too many kids. I have five. We have seven. <laughs> okay, you win. <laughs> so how God bless you. <laughs> uh, we took our two daughters with us, and our three sons are working at the table. Okay. Uh, they were running all over the way. And um, our youngest daughter, Mary, some of you may remember. Um, she's 20 now, and she still lives with me. And um, if I had a basement, she'd live in the basement. But you know, <laughs> but she's she's a really good young lady, and she's very helpful. And she's a Kiwi, and she will never move back here. The last time we came back with her in September, it, we we arrived in Indianapolis on September 7th. She come through the doors. I heard her say something. Stop laughing. I heard her say something and I thought she was complaining about the suitcase and I said what's the matter and she said it's so hot <laughs> and for a year she kept saying the U.S. is too hot the U.S. is too hot <laughs> and she just said that again and again I said yeah don't forget winter it's too cold too mm -hmm. so yeah Mariel is there and she'll stay there possibility Liana would move back um, she definitely wants to come back um, she always said she wanted to move back for a while Le Liana's got permanent residency. She can move back anytime she wants. Um, she wasn't there when we got citizenship, so she's not a citizen. What right. did schooling look like for them as they were growing up? <clears throat> schools? Um, the schools there are a bit different, um, but they 
it's they're they're a bit different, but they're similar to our schools too. They but they have they, you don't have one building, you have a bunch of buildings. That's that's how high school, primary school, they're all like that. So they actually have to go from building to building, and so the winter is the rainy season, so they have to walk out in the rain to go from building to building. Um, the classes are very similar. They uh, since we have a lot of Asians, there's a really high emphasis on math and education, so it's probably a bit better education, I think, there. It's very secular, too. Yeah, so, I mean, you really have to spend time with your kids and do a little deprogramming. It's very much mm -hmm. very liberal-minded in the things that they do and that they teach. Yeah. The Kiwis also, it's very common um, to go barefoot. So, when you go in somebody's house in Auckland, you always take your you always take your um, shoes off. And I'm having a hard time just saying I go to people's houses, I want to take my shoes off because I'm used to it. And so now, when I used to live here, I never wanted to take my shoes off. Now it's like, I'm in my shoes, like right now, I'm thinking, oh man, my feet are so hot, I gotta get my shoes take off. Take them off, it's okay. Because <laughs> <laughs> you get used to that, you know. Um, but a lot of Kiwis go barefoot, especially the kids. And it's really funny in the wintertime, it would be cold, it would be raining, and you'll see these kids coming out of school running barefoot, carrying their shoes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But in, in New Zealand, you can go into stores without any shoes on and without a shirt on. <laughs> they, they, they had a shirt when we moved there that the Kiwis didn't get. It, says, it said, no shirt, no shoes, no worries. <laughs> and of course, the Kiwis had no idea what it meant. <laughs> I hadn't explained to them why it was funny. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I assume that no shirt means no shoes. <laughs> What's that? <laughs> yes, for men only. <laughs> you know, we did find out. My mom, the last time my mom visited before she, her health got bad was about maybe four years ago. And we went to a section and we just went out. They had a, this deck that went out along the ocean. And we were just going in. And Brenda's walked by. In fact, I, I'd lived there all this time and didn't know that, that you can just go out on the beaches nude in, in Auckland. <laughs> They usually go out around the corner, but I didn't know that. And Brenda is walking by, and she said, there's a naked guy down there. And my 80-year-old mom says, where? <laughs> I said, mom. You know, I thought she'd pretty frail until I tried to pull her away from that rail. She didn't know me, you know? Like, wow, my mom. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, they're in, inactive. They're not dead. They used to be dead until 1981 when Mount St. Helens blew. They're no longer dead. Now they're inactive. <laughs> Auckland actually gets um, over 200 earthquakes a year. And we just don't feel them. Yeah, so they get earthquakes all the time, but they're so small that we don't. Uh, earthquakes in New Zealand are a bit different. Uh, earthquakes in New Zealand last a long time. Most earthquakes are very short, but they're very intense. So the earthquakes in um, New Zealand are shallow, which makes them, even if they're not as strong, makes them, the force of it is, uh, on the surface is, is more. So um, they're shallow and they last a long time. I was got up one morning early, probably six years ago, and had an earthquake down in um, uh, Kati Kati, which is a long way away from us. And it was actually felt clear up in Auckland. And I was up that morning early and I was in my chair and I felt it start going like this. And the, the, the rocker next to me started rocking. And of course I'm thinking, do I, do I get up and um, get the Brenda and the girls out or do I just go out and save myself and leave them? <laughs> do I get the doorway? And I, you know, I just sat there and waited and just kept steady. But it went on for probably over two minutes and then it quit. But they, I'm, t I'm told that's very rare for trimmers to last that long. But that's that's why Christchurch was so devastated, was the trimmers were shallow and they went on for a long, long time. And I talked to people down there, they said they, they felt like it was never going to stop. It just shook for so long. Mm -hmm. But Christchurch, a lot of people don't know this, when they had that really bad earthquake, you know, when you have aftershocks and they, the aftershocks continue and they just taper off. Christchurch had aftershocks at least once a month for over a year, at least once a month that were over five on the Richter scale. I mean, I know people that lived in Christchurch that finally just moved to Auckland. They said, we couldn't take it anymore. 
Um, so they, they finally abated, but it just went on. And they continue to have aftershocks. They call them aftershocks for probably a year and a half or more after that huge quake that, that um, devastated the city. Uh, they also have what they call liquefaction. They've got a lot of um, silt and stuff just under the soil. And so when it shakes, that oozes up and it's just like, just just like ooze. Yeah. And it, you know, they had houses that had a foot of this in it and it was just, there's just no way to move it. They, they, they'd be on the roads and they'd have payloads and they'd try to scoop it up and just push it down the road. It's, it's a real problem in Christchurch. And so they have sections of the city that they've, that they've condemned. They won't allow them to build houses anymore. Yeah. So for time's sake, I'll ask the last question. And if you want to visit a little bit more afterwards, you can. But, uh, you know, we're going to be praying for the next step when yeah. Philip is ready to take over, whether you're helping this other church to revitalize or do a church plant. What are some other things we can be praying for you for, Mike? Um, yeah, I appreciate you praying for Brenda. Um, it's, and, and for me, with Brenda, it's been really difficult to come in here. Um, yes, the hardest thing I've ever done. Um, just, I, I know many of you still know Brenda, but um, we went into lockdown in August, and we were in lockdown a week in. She looked at Mary Ellen, she said, why is that woman in our house? And the next week she said, is your name Mike? And then she asked if we were married and it got really difficult for her and she was quite anxious and she seems to be doing okay now. Um, they've, they've got, she was extremely anxious and so I think they've got the medication um, sorted out where she seems like, I don't want her to be over medicated, but she seems content. That's the word that I like to use. I, I said, I don't want her to be doped up, um, but I, I don't want her to just be, I mean, she wasn't happy. She was just you know, and she mm -hmm. saw people coming in her room at night and all kinds of stuff. And so I think we've got that sorted, but just pray for Brenda. Brenda still prays all the time. And about half the time, I'll pick her up and take her out. And while we're driving, she'll just start praying out loud. And the first two times uh, was kind of shocking to me. And, um, I realized it was a bit unsafe that I was going to have to keep my eyes open when she prayed. So, <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, she's, um, you know, she always does that. She always tells me, I pray for you all the time. Mike. I pray for you all the time. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I'm thankful. Amen. Yeah. Well, uh, appreciate you sharing Mike. And uh, if you want to stay and ask some more questions, uh, feel free to come and, and catch him. Now, what I do want to do before we, we dismiss is uh, have a couple of ushers come forward. Again, some of you all may not be prepared to give tonight. That's okay. But if you want to give, uh, we do support uh, Mike and Brenda on a monthly basis. But just to help cover some costs while he's here in the States, uh, we would invite you to uh, just give a little something. If you're watching online and you want to give online, you can do that at fbcrobinson.com slash give. Um, and then just, just put other in there and just put Mike Cooper. Um, if, if you're not prepared tonight and you think, well, I want to give something on Sunday, um, you can do that as well. Uh, we'll probably go ahead and give him what we collect tonight uh, now, and then uh, we can always add that to his support um, afterwards as well. So let me pray for us, and then uh, we'll take up our offering, and then we'll be dismissed. Father, I thank you so much for uh, – Lord, I thank you for how you put a calling on each of our hearts, Lord. I thank you for Mike's testimony on how you called him and Brenda to go – uh, and be missionaries. Uh, Lord, how you drew them to New Zealand uh, by way of Japan. Um, Lord, it's just always neat to hear how you have a purpose for each of our lives and you make that clear to us. And I thank you for Mike and Brenda's faithfulness um, to serve you. Lord, we pray for Mike and his next steps in ministry. And Lord, we pray as he continues to train with Philip and, and gets him prepared to take over their current church uh, on a regular basis for Mike to, to step back from that. And Lord, you are going to open up again a ministry for him, whether it be um, with this uh, neighboring church that needs revitalization, whether it needs to be a church plant in a, an unreached city. Now, Father, we pray that you would uh, bring people in his ministry that would make it clear to him how he's supposed to serve you. And Lord, we do pray for Brenda. We, we continually ask that you would just give her uh, comfort. Lord, help her not be anxious. Now, Lord, be with Mike and, and be with his children as well as um, you know how difficult it is 
Lord, just to, to see someone you love and care for just suffering. You know, we pray that you would give them days of, of clarity of mind, Lord. Let, let her be able to, um, and Lord, just enjoy her time with her family and, and Mike as well. We pray for him as it's been a difficult transition uh, with Brenda moving into a home as well. We, we just ask that you would give him comfort uh, and Lord, give him encouragement. And Father, we pray for our church that we'd be faithful to always lift up uh, not just missionaries across the world, but particularly the missionaries we are blessed to know and, and uh, serve alongside of from a distance. And we pray now that you would bless the offering we take up uh, just to be a little something for Mike to, uh, to help him as he's traveling around here on his furlough. We love you and we thank you. It's in your name we pray. Amen. All right, we'll collect the offering uh, as the ushers go by. And then uh, you guys have a great week. We'll see you all Sunday morning. Students, if you can go upstairs, that way we can move some tables and that sort of thing. And Logan, while you're up there, if you can stop the live stream, that'd be great. Yep. It's around to your turn.